Well, to discuss this, we're joined from Oakland, California, by a Black Lives Matter leader, Melina Abdullah. In New York is Zeli Imani, co-founder of the Black Liberation Collective. And in Boston is conservative political commentator Benji Irby. I thank you all for joining us here on The Newsmakers. Zeli Imani, let, let me start with you. When we, we look at the names, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, and so on, their names on a, on a timeline that almost becomes a, a sort of mythological history when we look at something fundamentally troubling that's happening in the culture within the United States. But five years on after Michael Brown's death, six years since the founding of Black Lives Matter, has there been any real change? Well, first, white supremacy isn't a fringe movement. It's here, it's always been here. It existed before Mike Brown, before Eric Gardner, before Tamir Rice. Um, part of the work of the Black Lives Matter movement has been able to name that white supremacy because it exists in our policies, our practices, and our institutions, and be able to work against it. Um, so we have many successes in regards to having those larger conversations. We've seen some states and cities pass legislations and have conversations about body cameras, inherent bias training, and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, because we are confronting a massive system, we have begun a lot of pushback from the same white supremacist institutions. Melina Abdullah, Black Lives Matter, has it been a failure or a success or something in between over the past six years? I think that those models of failure and success um, really kind of don't capture what movement is, right? So there's successes and there's challenges. Um, I think when we think about the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement as um, being on a continuum of black freedom struggle, it's absolutely um, an honoring of those who've walked before us. I think that six years ago, when we decided to stand up, when we said we're going to build a movement, not a moment, that's absolutely, if we want to call it a success, we can call it a success. But I think we can also call it a much larger victory. Um, the awakening of black people to our own power, the stepping into our own power, um, is beyond kind of the measures of um, policy or the measures of, you know, wins and losses. And so I think the birth of the movement is a victory in and of itself. I think that there's also, there are measurable victories, right? So when we think about, I'm here in Los Angeles, we passed a police transparency bill, which for the first time gives us access to police records that had been shielded from us, right? We got five officers who murdered Keisha Michael and Mark Quentin Sandlin fired. We got the police chief fired, right? We got, um, there's lots of different victories happening and right. we're still moving. So we're looking back and also moving forward. Right. Benji Irby, five, six years ago, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone beyond Black Lives Matter activists saying things like white supremacy or maybe some people on university campuses. But now we're seeing even the president, Donald Trump, name white supremacy as a problem after a massacre. We're seeing Ted Cruz name it. With that in mind, are the previous two speakers right that there's been a success, that the discourse has been changed, and that the movement has legitimacy? Well, I think that there's definitely a lot of the idea of Black Lives Matter is very noble, and I think that there are definitely some things that have come along to um, to push the conversation forward. But my only issue with it is just some of the ways in which the protests are and some of the ways in which um, they go about the rhetoric. Some of the rhetoric that they have is a little bit um, problematic. But I do think that it's, a, it's ultimately a good thing. I think it ultimately has a noble goal. Um, mm -hmm. I just feel as though instead of trying to go against this ubiquitous term of white supremacy, uh, let's work further with the CBC and try to get a, a, a law that just has police with cameras for everyone, everywhere. Even what happened with um, in South Bend, Indiana, we find that the young man that was killed, the policeman didn't have his camera on, which is crazy to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that Black Lives Matter, even as a Republican, as a conservative, is necessarily a bad thing. It's just some of the rhetoric sometimes and some of the protests that can cause people to get arrested, I don't think are helpful. Okay, so give me an example of something that you don't like. 
Um, at the end of the against police, I think that all police aren't bad. Obviously, there are bad apples, but we need to work better with the police. And we also need to, instead of trying to blame white supremacy for everything, we know that police commissioners are often hired and work underneath mayors. So let's target mayors. Like, mm -hmm. I, like what happened in South Indiana under Pete Buttigieg was great. I think that the people of that city, the black community of that city, they went they went to him, let him know what was going on, and they ultimately derailed his presidential campaign, whether he knows it or not. And I think that if we start making those types of targeted uh, moves toward people in power who actually have the power to do things instead of going out on the streets and being destructive, I think we'll be much better as a people and as a nation. Uh, Benji, when you come across on your social media feed, every week there seems to be some sort of video of a traffic stop of some sort, or even if it's just a guy on a university campus just minding his own business, but because he's black, invariably it's a white cop coming up saying, show me some ID, you don't deserve to be here. And we, we always almost reach that, that point where the cop is almost a split second away from pulling the trigger just because the person's black, right? When you see that stuff, don't you feel angered as well? Well, I think there are definitely times where, you know, there are cops who do things wrong. Obviously, there are a lot of bad apples. But then there are also are situations where even if we look at a lot of these, you know, big cases, there are places in which we looked at everybody wasn't exactly innocent in the whole thing. So we have to start looking at things individually. Obviously, in the case of Eric Garner, I mean, that was just ridiculous. But even looking at the fact that that happened in New York City under de Blasio, and de Blasio gets reelected, and there are a lot of people who support Black Lives Matter who voted for this man. I don't really understand how that works. I feel like if we're going to if we're going to protest, if we're going to say these things are bad, then we need to start targeting political power and stop voting in the same people who allow these atrocities to happen underneath them. These mayors and such. You could even right. take. For example, what happened in Baltimore? Same right. thing. Democrat mayor. Why are these people right. continuing to get reelected and continuing to get black people's support? Uh, okay, interesting points there. So, Melina Abdullah, when we look closely in a more granular way at some of the individual cases, for example, I've heard the argument where people say, well, with Freddie Gray's killing, the cops were predominantly black and Hispanic, as far as I understand, and everybody in a position of power in the city was black and Democrats, so it's too easy to say this is white supremacy and a problem of, with the Republicans. It's probably a little bit more deep and a little bit more complex. Do you accept that? So it's absolutely white supremacy, no matter who the actors are. So it's really important. Um, I would push back very vigorously against um, the point that was being made about police having some bad apples, right? And the example that you're giving actually points to how white supremacy actually works. And so this is actually what I study. I'm a professor of Pan-African Studies mm -hmm. who studies white supremacy, right? And so we need to understand that white supremacy has always searched for what we call proxies, right? And so white supremacy doesn't always just come through the form of white skin. They often put in um, actors who move forward a system that is inherently white supremacist. And so when we think about policing in this country, and this is beyond debate, right? We know that policing in this country evolved from slave catching, right? We know that policing in this country was intentionally designed to produce these outcomes. Just read Kelly Lytle Hernandez, read Manning Marable, read anyone who writes on the role of um, white supremacy in systems. Hey, we could read uh, Black Power by Kwame mm -hmm. Ture and Charles Hamilton, and we understand how systems work. So it's important that even as we look at individual cases, we understand the role of systems. I also want to speak back to this idea that disruption, that protest is inappropriate. Killing black people is inappropriate. <laughs> Killing black people is what we have to think about. Mm. We have to think about how these systems descend on the lives of black people. Yesterday, I was with several families of those who've been killed here in Los Angeles. Ryan Twyman, a 24-year-old um, black young father of three, was um, murdered by L.A. County sheriffs on a day when L.A. County sheriffs murdered three people and LAPD added one. So four people killed in Los Angeles alone in a single day, right? Mm. Um, we have to say that families have a right 
to be outraged. And communities have a right to be outraged. The example of South Bend was raised. I've been to South Bend. I've been organizing in South Bend um, or working with the organizers in South Bend, um, including Black Lives Matter South Bend. Um, I don't know if um, your guest knows, but on Saturday, they just staged a massive 24-hour encampment in front of City Hall because they haven't gotten everything that they need. And he's right. We do need to push beyond police. We do have to put pressure on elected officials. But more than that, I think we need to think about, well, what kinds of systems do we want? And so just finally, if we think about what Black Lives Matter has done um, as an abolitionist movement, an abolitionist movement does doesn't just seek to dismantle what is, dismantle policing that kills us, dismantling, dismantling a jail system that incarcerates us. It also visions what we want. So what we want is a public safety system that is uh, much bigger um, and more uh, forward thinking. Um, that really kind of builds in safety, true safety for communities. Mm -hmm. That means mental health resources. That means livable wage jobs. That means permanent housing. That means recognizing that communities all want to be safe, and we have tools um, to create our own um, safety mechanisms. And mm -hmm. so it's really important that we understand that, that we uplift that, and we understand that as a victory that we're currently winning through Black Lives Matter, and that we continue to push for these things and use a variety of means. So, yes, voting, absolutely. But voting plus. It's right. not enough to go to the ballot box and vote somebody in or out. We also have to do organizing on the ground. Okay. And, Benji, I'm going to give you a chance to respond in a moment. But to that point about voting and organizing and changing the system from within, Zeli Imani, uh, a couple of months after Michael Brown was killed, I was on the ground in Ferguson during the Ferguson October protests. Now, a couple of interesting things were going on there. On the one hand, you had people saying there won't be an indictment for Darren Wilson, the policeman who had shot dead Michael Brown. They, they knew it. They said he's not even going to go to trial. The prosecutor and the grand jury is not going to even indict him, and they were proven right. And also, looking at some of the available statistics at the time, even though Ferguson was predominantly African-American, only about 12% of people had actually voted, and they were woefully underrepresented, right, in the police force, in government, and so on. So mm -hmm. it speaks to a total distrust of the very systems that are in place, that even if people are saying, hey, vote, hey, inject yourself in this process and change it, they were saying, listen, we don't trust it, and we don't believe we'll have any justice. So five, six years right. down the line, has any of that changed? I don't believe that much has changed um, five, six years down the line. We have the same distrust of these institutions that are um, raised up in our culture to serve and protect us. And even as the, the professor had noted, that white supremacy and racism is so ingrained in American soil that you don't necessarily need quote unquote racist um, in place in order for it to survive. That means you can have a school board full of black and brown people and still the school board or school um, district does a disservice to uh, black and brown children. You can have an increase of black police officers but still see black police officers um, um, brutalized and even murder um, still unarmed black men and women in our country. So we see that the fact that it's not necessarily about who we put into these systems, is that the system itself is failing us. And what the sister was saying is that we need to not just focus necessarily on um, changing it or giving it a cosmetic change, we need to dismantle these systems, disrupt these systems, and envision what a new society will look like, envision what a new healthier institutions will look like that can provide safety, provide care, and provide quality living for all people, especially black and brown people in this country. Benji, do you believe that the system is as broken as has been described by Melina and Zeli? Sure, I think systems have been broken, but I just think that it's a much different reasoning. I think it's very easy to blame and say white supremacy as being like the have-all and be-all of anything that is bad. 
I personally, as a black man in America, don't believe that any white man born to a woman is supreme over me whatsoever, whether it be Donald Trump down to the homeless white guy at the gas station. There are no white people supreme over me. That's just not a belief that I take on. But I do think that as black people in our neighborhoods, we've definitely been failed by our leadership and that we have a whole congressional black caucus, which is the largest and most powerful um, ethnic caucus in Congress, and yet we're having these things happen, yet we're, having, we're not having the right laws put in. I think that a lot of us on the regular person side, on the activist person side, we need to start running for Congress ourselves, start running for senators ourselves and replacing these people, right. because I think that a lot of our quote-unquote black leadership are relics of the civil rights movement. All they know is, let's march, let's protest, let's do this, let's do that. It's 2019. I mean, we're out here right. cloning sheep. We okay. have all these technological advances that are going on. I'm not understanding why we're not at the table, why we're not in government, all these people that we put in government to make laws and changes. Number one being, why after all this time are body cameras not the right. law of the land, period? Like, I don't understand. Like, to me, that's a total failure of, you know, this big movement against the police. That's the least and the simplest thing that we can do, yet it's not being done. We're going around having a million protests talking about white supremacy, white supremacy, white supremacy. And every time I hear that, I just hear, if there's white supremacy, then what is the other side of that? Black Benji, inferiority? But, I'm not yeah, inferior to anyone. Benji, I want to ask you something about the, the very fact that you are an African-American conservative who hangs a question mark over Black Lives Matter and, I guess, the validity of the movement or the effectiveness of it, right? We've seen other African-Americans who are prominent, um, maybe not card-carrying Republicans, but who are prominent critics of Black Lives Matter, such as Sheriff Clark uh, of Milwaukee. Now, he, he gets the platform on Fox News. He comes on. The Fox News audience sees, here's a black man, and he says, you know what? Black Lives Matter is a hoax. Those are Marxists. They're idiots. They don't know what they're doing. They're complete imbeciles. As an African-American... Yeah, I don't think that. You know, I, I, I think the point I'm getting at is, do you think it's helpful when they tend to give a platform to African-American critics of Black Lives Matter, which then suggests to the audience that nothing really needs to change because, hey, we've got an African-American telling us so? But I don't think he's ever said that, you know, it... It's, not, it's never going to change, and the whole thing is stupid. I personally don't think that. I think that I know I'm a New Yorker, so I mean, you know, I'm Boston right now, but I'm from New York. So I know a lot of people that are involved in Black Lives Matter. I know a lot of Democrats. I just feel like our, as a Republican, as a conservative, we want the same thing, but it's just the biggest thing is just our approach to getting it. But I think that there's definitely a happy middle in there somewhere. And also, there's a, there's a way of you do things your way, I do things my way, but we both want the same goal. I'm also, you know, a young black man. I'm 36 years old. I definitely don't want to be targeted by the police. I've had issues with police in the past. I've handled them a lot differently um, in that there was not a violent situation or anything like that. But I do think that there is a part of us that needs to be able to move and pull in the levers of government and work this system just like every other ethnic group does. Right. Okay, talking about working the system, Melina Abdullah, the man at the very top of the system, does he make a difference? Absolutely. What he's done is really rip the mask off of white supremacy, give them complete permission. The white supremacy that I think, as Zelly rightly noted, you know, has always undergirded the foundations of this country, right? So this country was founded on white supremacy, right? Um, the white supremacist notion of manifest destiny, the white supremacist practice of chattel slavery, right? So this country was founded on white supremacy, so we need to be very clear that white supremacy is bigger, bigger than Donald Trump. However, what he's done is given those white supremacists permission to be as violent in their white supremacy as possible. So through his rhetoric, his policy, and his kind of nod to violence, um, yes, it's made an absolute difference, which for us means that we have to fight harder. And I think we also um, need to challenge um, news sources, media outlets, um, government, to um, remember that you can't be neutral at this moment. You can't. Um, pretend to be neutral at this moment. When you're talking about um, something that is evil, 
something that is violent, something that threatens the lives of people, it's important that we all take a stand. And I think that that means using a range of tactics. And so I keep hearing what your guest um, has been saying about voting. I want to be very clear that we absolutely have to get rid of this person who is occupying the White House. Mm -hmm. We have to get rid of this person. And that's done through voting and through engaging okay. our elected officials and trying to get them to get him out now. M Melina? But no one has ever voted their way right. to freedom. Okay, Melina, mm -hmm. something that's interesting is I see Benji mm -hmm. yes, I'm smiling and, and, and nodding. Uh, Benji, I'm assuming you're a Trump supporter. Correct me if I, okay. That's why I think this okay, is so Melina says Trump has ripped the mask of white, white supremacism here. He's a racist in the White House, and you're voting for him. Why? First of all, none of that is true. I mean, this, this is ridiculous. They do this with every Republican. They do this over and over and over again. Oh, Trump is like this big white supremacist. It's ridiculous. If we look at the laws that Trump has passed, if we look at prison reform, if we look at the fact that he's even he's even went and gotten ASAP Rocky out of jail, these are not things that a white supremacist yeah, on, I mean, would do. The, the president's saying, you know, he's trying to get the rapper friend of his rapper friend out of out of trouble with the law in Sweden. But that's not a, a not a contribution. A that's not a, a contribution to the African American, American community, citizen. is it? It's not about a, it's a contribution to someone as an American. You're saying this man's a white supremacist. So if I'm a white supremacist and the KKK member, I, of course, would not want to do anything for black people. I wouldn't want to touch them or be around <laughs> them. So, I mean, that whole idea is ridiculous. Okay. I think that they use all this rhetoric to keep black people in this state of being mad and upset. And at the end of the day, Donald Trump's not going to be president forever. More than likely, he's going to get reelected. So sorry about that for you guys. But He's not going to be president forever. We need to be looking more, bigger and larger. Okay. But it's always a matter of trying to pin something on one person and make that one person the enemy. When if we have a system that we're trying to change, let's look and change it for 100 okay. years. Let's get a response years. from what are we Zeta. Do? Okay. Okay. What are we going to do in 200 years? We assume so, you're talking so about white he's supremacy. clearly not, not listening because I actually said it's bigger than Trump. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. He, he's not listening okay. because Zeta. I said Zeta. it's bigger than Trump. <laughs> than white supremacists because that's, that's the way the rhetoric goes. Okay, let's get Zeli to come in. Zeli? It does not necessarily matter who is the face of this country. The country is itself is a white supremacist country. It's the fact that we have elected an outwardly explicit right. um, white supremacist who is able to use his platform to um, invoke a lot of division and stir up division that is a major problem. So it doesn't necessarily matter who exactly becomes the next president, right? Because we've seen that Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, um, John Crawford, all this happened under a Democratic president, not necessarily um, Donald Trump. But white a supremacy a Democratic and a, was still and a black is president. able to function. Yeah, a Democratic and a black president. And a black Z president. Z Zeli, right. something interesting. I remember Dr. Cornell West was criticized at the time at the time of Ferguson happening for suggesting that Barack Obama was making no structural changes and he was... In a way, he was disappointed by Obama because he felt Obama was just a figurehead. Is that now a more mainstream mm -hmm. view that Obama didn't do enough for African Americans during his eight years in office? I'm not sure if it's necessarily a mainstream view. You still have lots of people in the public who still uphold um, Barack Obama and still admire his work. But a lot of us who is on the ground, um, a lot of poor people, a lot of poor black and brown people have been really um, dissatisfied about not just Barack Obama, but even their local leadership. We see in many times we elect, you know, black and brown leadership and we still don't see anything happen materially that benefit our communities. So a lot of people are dis uh, disenfranchised. They are kind of disillusioned about the system and don't really necessarily vote anymore because they don't see the purpose of voting. And that's why I think the Black Lives Matter movement is so powerful, is because we're able to engage these people who have been so marginalized from that process in order to engage them in a new way, in order to, for them to be able to be participants in creating a new type of way to live. Okay. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion about power, about politics, about culture, and no easy answers to any of this. I sincerely appreciate you all taking the time to come and talk to us here on The Newsmakers. Melina Abdullah, Zeli Imani, and Benji Irby, thank you very much.